This is Writers on Film, the only podcast dedicated to books on cinema. Hello everybody and welcome to Writers on Film. My name is John Bleasdale. I am a writer and film critic and today I am talking to Kyle Turner who is the author of The Queer Film Guide, 100 films that tell LGBTIA plus stories. Uh, it's a wonderful book published by Smith Street with great illustrations by Andy Warren. The book is great and I'm really looking forward to talking to Kyle. He has had his work published in uh, a lot of different places, based in Brooklyn. He's uh, published in GQ, GQ, Paste Magazine, The Village Voice, New York Times, NPR, Slate, a lot of different places. Uh, and so I'm really glad to have the opportunity to welcome him onto the show. Thank you to Elliot Atkins for the music and thanks to um, Ali Harwood for the art. And remember, if you like, you can follow us on Twitter at DrJohnTDRJONTY. Uh, please remember to go over and check my new podcast, Cinema Italia, which is um, currently in its seventh or eighth episode. It's a really good accessible dive into Italian cinema and I'm including all all Italian films from Silence to Spaghetti Westerns, Giallo, Polizetsky, um, Sorrentino, Fellini, everything. So uh, neorealism, everything. So so if you haven't had a listen, uh, be sure and, and give it a go and see see what you think. It's, it's hopefully going to introduce some great new films to you uh, um, and also go over some great classics as well. Okay, that's enough. Before you do any of that, Enjoy the conversation. I think queerness means something different to everyone, um, especially those who uh, experience it. There, are, it encompasses so many different perspectives and ideas and experiences, um, and I wanted. Um, and I was hoping that the films that I selected for the book could be representative of that fluidity, could be rep representative of that malleability, because you have, of course, films with explicit and over LGBTQ um, IA plus representation, but you also have things that are a little bit more um, allegorical or metaphorical, like The Fly, the David Cronenberg film, where, which is timed very uncannily to the AIDS crisis in 1985. Um, you have something like uh, Jennifer's Body, which is very much an interrogating um, female friendship in a sort of homoerotic way. Uh, you have Beau Travail, the Claire Denis film, which is clearly about like um, masculine envy. So I um, thought it was important to sort of like survey the way in which um, queerness could exist as these different things within film itself, not only as the desire that exists uh, that um, sort of is transferred between two characters, but also as a sensibility or a pers perspective or um, an aesthetic point of view. Um, even something like um, everyone has an understanding that John Waters' Pink Flamingos is queer, but I think sometimes people struggle to articulate why, why that is. And I think that is very much has to do with is so um, confrontational and abrasive about its uh, connection to normative ideas of taste and um, aesthetic. So I, I wanted to make sure that there was a pretty wide understanding or a varied understanding of what queerness could be in this book. Yeah, I, it's, that's so, so interesting. I, when I was looking through, the Fly was one of those where I went, oh, wait a minute, how does that work? And then as you as you as I went through, of course, I remember the Fly coming out at the time and being seen very immediately as a as a uh, metaphor for AIDS. Yeah, and I think David Cronenberg's films. Um, I think what some audiences may not necessarily be aware of is that his, though he is like a straight identified filmmaker, um, his films have been embraced by the queer community because of their ability to investigate these um, really, I think, profound and tactile ideas of what it means to be human, the, the um, way that our flesh and our bodies can sometimes be um, under scrutiny or surveillance by these larger systems and larger societies. 
a video drone, of course, um, the fly, um, even something like um, uh, Eastern Promises or Existence. They're very much about the way in which uh, bodies are sort of interpolated by these broader systems um, and determined what they mean and what their value is um, against other bodies. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, that's that's so fascinating. Of course, he made Naked Lunch as well. I remember when he was being interviewed for mm -hmm. that, him him sort of confronting that problem of being a, as you say, a straight identifying filmmaker um, and dealing with you know an iconic key queer text in the, in William S. Burroughs' novel. Um, what about your in terms of yourself uh, coming to film? What what's your sort of backstory in terms of how do you get to to <laughs> to be writing the this book and how what's your what are the films that are sort of first having an impact on your life? Um, the apocryphal origin story, as I like to tell it, is um, when I was four or five, my mother showed me Howard Hawks's Bringing a Baby from 1938 with Cary Grant and Katherine Hepburn. Bless your mother. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was not allowed to watch the Disney Renaissance movies. So the like Little Mermaid and um, Aladdin and um, Lion King and all that, because uh, I was homeschooled very briefly uh, before I entered um, elementary school, which is like first grade, second grade, et cetera. Um, and throughout like the homeschool group that I was a part of at the time, apparently there was um, the rumor or the um, conversation uh, being circulated that there was subliminal imagery in those movies that the animators had put like different sexual innuendos and whatnot. Um, and that is a rumor that persists on the internet today. Um, but because I wasn't allowed to watch those, my mother showed me um, screwball comedies from the studio era, like His Girl Friday and Bringing a Baby and Bringing a Baby where there is um, an anal sex joke in the first five minutes. So it's an interesting sort of uh, redirection of my attention. Um, but watch that. And then I started a blog when I was like 13 and I was always trying to sneak in stuff about movies in my homework. And I knew from second grade on that I wanted to write about film or be a film critic or something. And then I just sort of like had very, had, had intense tunnel vision about that aspiration. Um, and I started writing on uh, the internet when I was like a sophomore in high school and started freelancing in a more professional capacity um senior year of high school freshman year of college and i've been freelancing for the last eight or nine years and my work has been in like gq and the village voice and as far as this book goes long long winded way of saying um i was approached by the australian publisher smith street, smith street books uh for this opportunity which i'm incredibly grateful for they wanted to do they had previously published a book called the feminist film guide by, mm. by mallory andrews and she's a really wonderful critic who i knew through Twitter, and she had uh, been uh, the editor of Cleo Journal, which was a feminist film journal based in Canada. And they asked her, like, um, if uh, if they had any ideas for the who they could get to write the queer film guide. And she gave them my name, and they approached me last May, and I was extremely excited. And I was like, yes, absolutely, I'd be happy to do that um, because I, um, as I was. Um, sort of exploring and understanding my own sense of queerness and my identity in college, like 1920, I was having these like really incredible conversations with my one of my favorite, favorite professors, Mark Greenlaw, and um, also Robert Lang. Um, and I was really coming to understand how film could be a form of queer creative expression. And I was really um, interested in how that could be a, 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 an aspect of film that I could study and um, become passionate about it. Because previously I just sort of had this, like, I, was, I loved movies, but I had a generalist knowledge and I wanted to have something that I could, that could you be a tool of self-knowledge and um, exploration and queer cinema ended, be, ended up being that thing. So writing this book feels sort of like a full circle moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you think, in the actual in in writing itself, there is a kind of um, uh, a, a a a queer eye, if if you if you permit me the the phrase, uh, in the sense that I when I was reading your book, there's there's a sort of there's a real verve to the writing, and there's a real you know snap to it, and there were some words that were coming up, which um, you know in terms of maybe my uh, my 
awareness is a little bit limited but you know I, what was the phrase oh queer dose i just i just thought oh that's <laughs> that's brilliant i want to know if that's your coinage or not uh, do you think that do you are you aware of of um of that sort of informing your writing on on a just a, a level of sort of the, the language you're using and the the voice that you that you um that you have well first of all thank you so much that really means a lot to me i uh, feel like i've been you know uh just behind a, a typewriter or a keyboard for so many years. And it's, it feels um, very special to have people recognize the hard work that I've been doing. Um, as far as having a queer eye for language or for style or syntax, um, I, for the record, did not coin the term queerdos. I think that's okay. something that um, is sort of passed around um, from person to person. And I'm happy to be able to carried along with me. Um, but I I think it's been a, a journey of the last several years to figure out where my observations about queerness and identity and sexuality can um, coalesce into a sense of style um, and figure out the vocabulary and the um the construction of certain words or sentences um so that they are able to convey uh, both like a unique point of view with regards to my queerness and and in the context of this book queerness more broadly um and also be able to uh convey that in a in ex in, ex in an accessible and fun manner like um uh, i would like to think that generally speaking that my um that my writing style is fun to read in general or at least uh, not uninteresting um but this book posted a really fun a really compelling challenge in that like writing a blurb um you're doing a bunch of things at once and that uh, because of the format of this, this book which is 100 main entries all about 350 or so words you have to tell the audience what the movie is and describe what the movie describe what the movie is um and then you have to tell them what's unique about it um and then you also have to provide your own point of view about what is unique about it or what's interesting and, and worth watching um and that was a really it was um definitely a challenge um and definitely work but it was exciting to be able to figure out how to blend all those different um, functionalities, I guess, of the writing um, together and see how I could put it in my voice um, and see how I could make it um, exciting and um, fun to read. I, I, it was a big goal was how can I get someone to watch this movie? Yeah, I, I think it was fairly simple in that way. How can I get someone to watch this movie, um, especially with movie, especially with some of the selections that like people already know about? Mm. Um, or Breck Mountain or um, Hedvig in the English or the Rocky Horror Picture Show, it was how can I show an audience um, who's heard of this movie uh, and give them a reason to actually take a look at it? Because um, you can Google so many different reviews and essays about many of these films, um, but not only is it what do I have to say about it, but like what what is the thing going to be to get someone to not just look at this page, but also maybe rent it on YouTube or Amazon or buy the Criterion Blu-ray or something. Um, what, how can I use language as a way to, to convey like what's exciting about this movie and why it deserves attention? Does that make sense? Yeah, no, absolutely it does. And I mean, uh, I, I, I think there's a, uh... There was, I mean, okay, so there are some classic movies here which have, you know, have undeniably um, queer cinema in terms of their, uh, you know, their stated purpose, let's say, and the, and the you know, I don't want to go into intentionality too much. But I think uh -huh. some of the some of the things you have to do just because of the very nature of the law uh, that, that I, I mean, I was... I, I kind of knew this, but didn't know I knew this. But um, when you write about the adventures of Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, uh, Al Clark, by the way, the producer of that film, was on the podcast a few weeks ago. He 
Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah. He's a wonderful guy, wonderful producer. He actually was going around uh, when they were sort of location shooting for that. Uh, he went around with the writer and director and uh, they had the um, some dresses in the back of the van and they would jump out at Ayers Rock and put on the drag and take photographs of each <laughs> other to use that to sort of sell the idea uh-huh. of the film to other people. So it was a great... Uh-huh. great Great little anecdote. But, you know, you mentioned in that that, you know, the law in ta- uh, Tasmania isn't, you know, it, homosexuality is still illegal in 1997. I mean, 1997. Mm-hmm. So, so when you're looking at a lot of these films, the idea of what you said earlier about uh, it, it, sort of the queerness has to some degree be sort of coded and has to, you have to look in and sort of pull it out. It's not... It, it it's part of its DNA that it is coming out via codes and via sort of hidden um, hidden away just to, to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I, I think as not to um, make broad generalizations, but for a long time as queer people, we had very little else but to use that language of reading into things, reading queerness into things and looking for these signs and signals. Um, and um, it wasn't just out of a level of a wish fulfillment or paranoia um, that these people existed, but the fact that like many queer people did exist in the film industry in Hollywood and they were putting these things in movies as a way to signal to the to other people in the audience, you know, that they're, um, you know, they're one of us, so to speak. Um, and um, it, not, it, and sometimes it wasn't even intentionally to signal to audiences that someone queer was behind the camera or, or in um, some sort of creative role, but also it was just an expression um, of themselves. It was also sometimes just a, a way to um, challenge or move forward um, the story or the aesthetic. Like, um, for a long, t- uh, um, my um, one of my best friends, professors um, at Manhattanville, I uh, spent a lot of his research um, examining the Hayes production era and the Hayes production code and the things that were intentionally taken out of movies. Mm-hmm. Um, because when you were submitting your film um, for uh, not ri- it, 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 this was prior to the Motion Picture Association of America, where you would get a rating, um, you would submit it to the studios and um, they would tell you to take things out and whatnot. Um, anything that sort of transgressed those normative values, no interracial relationships, no premarital sex, yada, 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 obviously no queer people. And so you can, um, there's a lot of, there's a, there, there are paper trails as to what was not allowed in movies mm-hmm. and anything that was too uncouth or, or too queer or too, um suggestive so you can look at these different reports and glean from them like what certain things were what things were in movies that would indicate like some sort of other within society um and i think that's really really fascinating that um the that both the ability to read into movies but also see where something was taken out um i think that's such an interesting part of especially like Western and American film history. And and, um, it requires, I think, for viewers to be active um, in their participation as opposed to just passively watching something. I think what could be exciting about this book and exciting about watching the movies in this book is that even if it's not obvious, you're um, encouraged to engage with the movie and have a dialogue with the film. Um, And I think sometimes this is me on my old like crotchety soapbox. Mm. Um, I think sometimes uh, viewers can be a little bit too passive. Um, I think what's fun about cinema is that um, not only as a tool of self knowledge and a way to understand the world around us, or to uh, as a refraction of the world around us, um, there's a real potential to engage and and talk back at the movie or talk with the movie um, and understand how the film is negotiating all these different ideas and these different like social sexual politics and so i I always think that that is a really fun um sort of challenge to have uh, as a viewer following on from that i think your description of william freakin's cruising I, I was really, really interesting because I love that film and I know it's a bit a controversial film and yet you you sort of nailed 
I mean, you, I don't mean you nailed it because you agreed with me. It was when I read it, I, went, <laughs> I kind of went, ah, that's that's it. That's exactly it. The idea that the camera kind of follows the, the uh, Al Pacino's main character in the way it looks at things. It looks at things homophobically to begin with, cliches mm-hmm. and stereotypes, and then sort of a slightly morbid fascination of like, oh, what the hell's going on here? And then by the end of it, it's kind of like really comfortable with the world that it's in, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, I, mm-hmm. I just thought that was a really interesting point of view. And and also, in terms of what you said, it's that idea of an interaction with a film rather than just like, give me, I'm going to sit here passively and you tell me what I want to hear. It's like, I'm going to be disturbed stu- disturbed and upset by some of this and, and you, I have to come on a journey, you know? Yeah, yeah, you're going to be probed by it, prodded. Uh, cruising has become a... When when people have been asking me like what my favorite crew film is sort of throughout this process, I've been going back to cruising because it's it is so fertile for exploration and consideration, and it inspires so many fun conversations. I just did a screening of it um, at the Roxy Cinema in New York, uh, a double feature of cruising and uh, the Jan Gonzalez twenty eighteen um, French slasher movie Knife Plus Heart. And mm. how the film, it was really fun to put those films in dialogue with one another. But cruising is just like, it's, I think we, at least I have the benefit of time um, and uh, retrospective and whatnot to be able to think and um, engage with this movie sort of outside of its original context a little bit while understanding the context of its original release in 1980 bad timing like great movie bad timing like the new york anti-violence project um was created in the late 1970s to address very very real anti-queer violence um and like william freaking was like yeah i'm gonna make this movie about like murders happening uh, murders happening to the gay community um not not great timing but like i find his willingness to get into the muck of what I think a lot of mainstream queer people were kind of unwilling to acknowledge about, you know, the reality of some of our lives. Like we, it, it shouldn't really matter, but like the sex that some people enjoy is a little bit more um, unusual or it deviates from traditional ideas of like what sex looks like. And that deserves as much respect and um, and is as valid as any other kind of sex. And, but to use this as like a as a social setting and as a political setting, I think is really fascinating because it requires a level of adventurousness or um, boldness to make the connection between the kind of aesthetic that is being fetishized within a uh, queer community, uh, which draws a lot from the iconography of uh, the police state and fascism and Nazism and whatnot, and to connect that between like the rate at which the queer people were or were not being accepted in society and sort of the um the politics of new york of the era because it's very much pre pre rudy giuliani very ed Koch era trash everywhere it stinks it's like you can feel the grime of it so it's really i, I think it's like really fun to think about how william friedkin, friedkin is using this like sexual subculture as a way to describe which it, um um, illustrate like what American politics looked like at the time, um, even if it means sort of like using a very messy, messy metaphor as a way to get there. And the fact that he sort of implicates the viewer in that by having these like slow pans and dollies across these um, leather bars, the fact that we are ourselves becoming more and more intrigued by this world, that we are becoming more fascinated, more immersed in it. I think that's so exciting to to be a part of and kind of getting used to as well i mean the, the, yeah. as, as you're watching it you're sort of like uh, well i mean i'm talking from a from my own sort of chiz straight perspective but i'm watching it going oh what's this i've never seen this before and then mm-hmm. and then like oh okay i'm used to it now yeah yeah the, and, and you also have that idea of the fish out of water formula or trajectory that a hollywood movie has where you have this al pacino character who is at the time one of the biggest heartthrobs uh, Hollywood mm-hmm. has to offer, and he's he's kind of yeah, his sexuality is is up for grabs, literally. 
Yeah, yeah. And he was such a, and I think continues to be such an icon of a certain kind of 70s masculinity. Um, he is very much of the like, Robert De Niro, taxi driver. Yeah, Robert De Niro, Willem Dafoe, um, that old whole era of like Paul Schrader, Martin Scorsese, like kind of masculinity where they are sort of adrift, they're sort of recovering from the national trauma of like the Vietnam War and Nixon and whatnot. Um, and having him, who we usually associate with having a very strong sense of self, like we when we see Al Pacino on the screen, very rarely will we think. We, that guy doesn't know who he is. That guy um, it ha is having some sort of like existential crisis. But to reframe how we understand Al Pacino's iconography, I think is really, really um, exciting and disturbing and scary in a, a productive way. I mm -hmm. like to, I, I usually describe cruising to friends who have not seen it as like, Cruising is homophobic, but in the best way possible. In a productive way. <laughs> way. Yeah, yeah. So, so let's go let's go back a little bit because also the other thing that is interesting is you start off with a a couple of um silent films and and semi-silent films. I th yes, you start with different from others. Mm -hmm. Uh is the first film you mentioned? I mentioned Wings. I did not include Wings. I mean, that is the tragedy of having limited space in like a set 100 there are a bunch of movies that were sort of like up in the air especially um if i want to if i want to articulate the idea that um queerness has been on film for almost as long as film itself has existed um but also um get to presentations that were a little bit more direct and a little bit easier i think for audiences to sort of wrestle with um there was like there there were a bunch of films that i that i had to pick from um mm. in order to explore that idea while also being able to sort of like um it, it, since the film it, it, since the book is is framed chronologically so pick those movies and then also move forward in time to show an evolution of what queerness looked like on the screen and how queerness was um being discussed culturally and, and socially um and so different from the others is the first one um and i think it's useful that that is the first one the first official entry in the in the book um partially from like a historical perspective um 1919 it was very much a product of these uh basically educational films that doc dr magnus hirschfeld was making with filmmakers at the time um in weimar era berlin um, and to sort of contrast that brief queer or social utopia that existed at the time, um, even as it it was, even if that film was being um, used with a particular with a, a fairly particular purpose, in, which is which was to educate um, and to inform other people in Germany because there was still a penal code that outlawed homosexuality at the time, and contrast that against um, later films where even as they're being released in the night uh, the 2020s um that there is this kind of juxtaposition against a cultural landscape in which queerness is much more broadly accepted but also that we are living in a time in the united states at least although the like the conservative right-wing backlash is kind of global um but that that there was a, a kind of a similarity or at least a mirroring of what was going on, despite the fact that we have like a, a I think the the cultural fluency around queerness is significantly different than in 1990. 1919, sorry, 1919. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I wanted to, I did want to uh, bring this up and um, I promise we'll, we'll sort of get to sort of lighter issues as well because I don't want this <laughs> to be, I don't want this to be just uh, like, wow, how terrible things can be. But um, I've noticed recently that I think homophobia and transphobia uh, is like being exploited as almost like the tip of the spear of a far right culture of sort of hatred and i mean in the space of the last month we've gone from um very basic transphobia to um to uh, drag shows being picketed books being banned 
and and all of a sudden pride which has kind of not even been controversial for like the last 10 20 years has suddenly become a, a, a target for for this this sort of concerted hatred i mean uh, uh yeah that's my point of view just as a uh, uh being outside of the community but i mean what w- what's what's your take from from within well personally i think gays don't deserve rights um no that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's uh, a surprise but, let, but let's yeah that. <laughs> from the author of the queer film guide queers don't deserve rights um it's really rough um right and and it's hard not to find it kind of depressing um and i don't i i do not lay blame for the queer community about this like mm. i think that um i think conservatives would have found a way with the different tools at their disposal especially the fact that like so many um silicon valley people um do swing conservative and do have a lot of power and do have a lot of influence over politicians, um, at least in the United States. I, I um, can't necessarily speak to uh, things more internationally, but I think the existence of these different platforms and apparatuses certainly has not ha- ha- has been um, almost instrumental in being able to spread and give power to those outside of the United States as well um, in terms of voicing these bigoted um, and and um, harmful and oppressive beliefs, which then sort of like get recycled and and, uh, and weaponized by those who are actually in power and have and have the um, means to make other people's lives miserable. Um, long circuitous way of saying I I am um, I, I think it reveals the ultimately problematic way that a lot of queer politics has sort of um, aimed its primary goals at at assimilating into society. And that is Mm -hmm. purely my perspective. I understand that there are definitely useful ways to, uh, and and understandable reasons as to why um, marginalized communities would want that. Um, Marginalized communities, regardless of whether they are queer or uh, racial or ethnic or religious or able-bodied backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera, deserve equity and justice regardless. Um, and I think what we are seeing is um, the failure that, like, if the queer community was going to primarily focus its efforts on marriage, it meant that, like, other people were who don't want that or didn't have access to it or didn't have the resources to access it, yada, yada, yada would not necessarily fall under the purview of those who are protected, those who, uh, people who don't want like the middle class um, lifestyle, picket fence, children, et cetera, uh, wouldn't have necessarily, wouldn't necessarily have access to those rights or, or those protections. Um, and that so much energy was spent on trying to get those, those things, um, I think, it's become much easier to have those things sort of like thrown back in our faces because as useful as marriage is as a financial decision and as a tax reason in the United States, um, it is not a band-aid for everything. Like it doesn't solve a lot of like the policy issues regarding homelessness or employment. Um, And it's, really scary and upsetting and uh, frustrating to see things that were three or four years ago under like liberal-ish or neoliberal political circumstances that these things are now like um subject to just to like intense hatred and discrimination it's really i i apologize for not being able to sound articulate about this no just, no it's ridiculous it's like it is like in in a less refined way. It's like ridiculous. Like uh, I saw a TikTok of like this school librarian who was being asked to like throw out all of these books because they were like too woke. And I'm like, these were very very basic history books. And um, I'm curious. Like the the sense of fascism is is it feels. Um, 
like so um visceral and and um even though i i'm based in new york and i think i i and i am in a position of like extreme privilege um being middle class life at little middle-ish class lifestyle in brooklyn um with my like lefty friends it's still there is enough proximity to these things that are happening it's it is unbelievable and i it feels unfortunate and upsetting to like not know what to do and um what is also like deeply upsetting is the fact that like many of the people who are doing this they're not the majority like mm. so many like different um official and unofficial polls like the pew research center uh, um and different like political polls that have been done by different outlets and publications are like we don't care we don't care about people like in in like an indifferent way that like isn't great but at least has this like tone of like of we will leave them alone like it doesn't matter to us one way or the other and it's really just like us a relatively small group of people that are extremely loud and have um uh, have incredible access to resources and to uh, policy and to law and whatnot that are making these decisions which are harming so many so many people and um it's a terrible sense of whiplash especially yeah. when we thought that um that there was a, a a bit of progress as far as being able to live in a world where create where um self-expression was not s so under uh, under such scrutiny that would cause such harm sorry that's a very long ramble no it's not it's uh, it's really interesting i really wanted to get your uh, to get your perspective on it and I, t I totally agree with you i think there's been this i think there is a temptation because it because this is a very minority it's a very hateful minority they know that they can't just say hey guys gay people are bad let's go back a bit because nobody would support them and everybody would laugh them out of town so what they do is mm -hmm. they target certain very particular groups they're not targeting yeah. sort of uh um a, a, a gay couple who are married they're targeting some sort of fetishists here or some sort yeah. of and they're, they're going ah yeah but look at this is look at what they're doing in front of children and they keep bringing up children in a very toxic way as well and mm -hmm. and it, and the, the temptation is to throw those people under the bus, is to say, yeah, that's a bit too much. We shouldn't have that in our pride parade. And it's just like, no, fuck these guys. They don't, they won't, that, don't surrender anybody. Not only for uh, the homosexuals, for the LGBTQ plus uh, community, but also for uh, heterosexuals who might want to have non-normative sex in ways that isn't, isn't sort of widely understood or cared about. So I just, yeah, it just, I, 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 your anger is utterly justified and, uh, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Happy Pride Month. Happy Monday. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But okay, let me let me get to a uh, to some of the more, um, so let's have some more fun. <laughs> <laughs> So one film that I loved that uh, uh, you included in the book, and I, I don't, I imagine it was a no-brainer. Funeral Parade of Roses. This is a, a ah, stunning. So yeah, can you t tell us a little bit about that for any of the listeners who might not have had an opportunity to see this yet? Yeah, so Funeral Parade of Roses is a film from 1969, directed by Toshio Matsumoto. Uh, um, Matsumoto was uh, his career was. Um, starting around the Japanese New Wave, which had a lot of inspiration from the French New Wave, obviously. Um, so like Seijun Suzuki and um, Nagisa Oshima. Um, but he was, uh, Matsumoto was really interested in like the way that film could um, create these worlds of fiction and reality. And he wanted to explore this underground world of um, queer and basically trans sex workers um, called um, gay boys and he wanted to use that social setting um, to make a film that was part narrative reimagining of um, Oedipus Rex by Sophocles part documentary about the social and cultural landscape of this underground Tokyo queer scene and then part experimental film to explore like the way that this world exists kind of within but also apart from like mainstream Japanese society and so what you have is like is this like incredibly 
kaleidoscopic and wild and crazy and fun um, and shocking film uh, about desire and sexuality and identity um, and the nature of cinema itself as a way to sort of perpetuate or to um, craft what identity is because you have this, like one of the very early shots in the film is through a mirror. You're watching one of the main characters um, sort of in a post-coitus scene um, as they're discussing um, their relationship and um, the sort of rivalry that exists between uh, one of the girls at the brothel and another one. Um, and it's shot through a mirror and it slowly pans away to re to reveal like where they where these two characters are in the room after they've had sex. Um, and it's really, really um, incredible. It has a sense of cartoonish fun. It is one of the, I think, few examples of trans cinema that I am aware of. I would definitely refer to uh, um scholars and critics who have um, who are much better versed in the history of trans uh, specific cinema than I am, uh, like Willow McClay, Clay, Caitlin and Juan Barkeen and Kate Mark Gardner and Liz Pachel, who are all really, really wonderful critics and, and scholars and f without whom this book would not exist for the record. Mm. Um, but like it's a film that is able to encapsulate like the um, contradictions and complexities of transness. Um, but in a way that doesn't sort of like focus or um, or only exist within a space of uh, trauma, I guess. Mm. Um, trauma is like a, a really big sort of subject matter that people love talking about these days, especially with regards to movies that deal with marginalized communities. But this film is not just that. It explores like the absurdity of like getting into fights with other women, getting into fights with other trans women and how catty and am I allowed to swear on this podcast? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. How catty and bitchy girls can be. How catty and, and I, I am borrowing this word from the community. Um, how how mean the dolls can be, as it were. Yeah. Um, yeah. it's uh, it's falls into this like perfect. It falls into this perfect category of of movies in this book that are like really rigorous and invigorating and challenging but also like really fun to watch this yeah. is a movie that i really like showing to people because um even though it's sort of outre and avant-garde um and is combining all these different um cinematic techniques and expressions that it's just like really entertaining it's mm -hmm. a it's a good watch I, I showed it um at the lgbt center in new york recently uh, and i was like really surprised and delighted to I uh, find that the that it was an almost full house, which was really cool. But like everyone had a good time. It's uh, I, I, there's this misconception that a lot of queer films, especially, are nothing but depressing, nothing but like AIDS stories and death stories and whatnot. But I think that is um, a misrepresentation of the breadth of queer cinema. And I think Funeral Parade of Roses is a really it is a really nice um, reply to that idea because it does engage in these ideas of like what it means to be, um, you know, an outcast in society, but it's also like really funny it, 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 and deals with like women arguing with each other in like uh, in their own language. Mm, absolutely. And, and I mean, you don't necessarily need his seal of approval, but Stanley Kubrick uh, often quoted it as one of his favorite films and a huge, mm -hmm. inf yes. huge influence on Clockwork Orange as well. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Given that, that, I, I I I love that we uh, after after having that great big moan, <laughs> which was <laughs> a thoroughly deserved moan, um, we 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 should sort of emphasize the positive with this, and that's a, that's a really good point of of sort of um, you know you want to have uh, queer cinema which is celebratory uh, as w without obviously you know uh, just dumping the realities and the political realities and marginalization what have you and the various problems mm -hmm. you know completely but you do want to want to not fall into this sort of um you know philadelphia slash brokeback mountain as good as yeah uh, as that might be being the only story we can tell right i think the story it um if i were to make it a very broad pronouncement i think the story of queer cinema is one of survival and survival means not just like going through the tragedy of, of tragedy, but also finding joy and community and 
connection. And one of the, the cinema has always been for me a tool of connection and finding people like myself, finding um, people share, to share things with. And I think the best of queer cinema is about that. It's about like throughout any sort of like political or social or cultural um, ostracization that there's still a way to express one's sense of self and identity and what we want, what we don't want, what things are important to us. Um, from the perspective often of like outsiders looking in that we can still find um, that power. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I mean, I'm someone who's definitely been educated via cinema in the sense that, you know, my upbringing, uh, you know, was from the 90s, you know, starts in the 1970s in a small village in northern England. And, you know, I, and and I've got, I've had to go on a very um, interesting uh, journey. You know, I come from working class background with parents who um, came from very traditional, my mum's Catholic, so very traditional background. And cinema has been, you know, uh, a brilliant way of sort of opening my eyes to other communities, as well as obviously I went to Liverpool, went to lots of different places, yeah. and found lots of different communities as well. But there's something about cinema that, that um, you know, it allows you to observe things that you wouldn't necessarily get the opportunity to observe and to confront you with things there's something safe in the darkness there uh, uh -huh. in order to do that as well. Um, one other question I wanted to ask is, of course, LGBTQ plus is uh, by its very definition and uh, becoming a very broad, uh, uh, different uh, spectrum, a, a rainbow, if you like, of different colors. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> see what I did there? Um, how do you balance that as uh, as um, a queer man? Are you looking at this and just uh, aware, oh, I've got this, this uh, how do I balance my lesbian, uh, my bisexual, my trans cinema? Uh, is there a, a, a preoccupation there or was it pretty easy? The way that I uh, uh, bounce them is that it's sort of like Noah's Ark and that I have at least two and they're paired together and they raise their hands. I, when I was compiling the list, um, the, the preliminary list for the book, um, it wasn't just out of like the necessity or the, um, the virtue signaling, if you will, of mm. wanting to include as much as possible and check boxes, yada, yada, yada. But like, as a queer person of color myself, for those of who are playing at home and are just looking at my name, I'm not actually white, even though um, people would beg to differ based on my tra dating track record. <laughs> but um, as a queer person of color, um, I am aware of the realities of having different identities um, intersect with one another and impact the way that you're perceived and negotiate uh, and move about the world. And I think it would have been intellectually dishonest to not be as inclusive as possible because, and I'm, uh, I also like, I'm aware of the problem of canon making and whatnot. And I want mm. people to think of this book as a queer film guide, not the film, gui film guide a queer film guide not the queer film guide even though that is the title i want this to be like a jumping off point for people to explore other expressions of film other movies that may not be included in the book other directors that are referenced and whatnot um but anyway i think it was like really important to be able to take what i've learned as a queer person and and having these people either really explicitly in my in my immediate life or or tangentially through being parts of other people's communities and whatnot, for them to be represented and seen in this book. Obviously, there is a problem with regards to um, the way that uh, that um, resources are allocated to people and their ability to imagine or, or uh, bring their creative projects to fruition because of the systems and apparatuses that um, may not allow them to do as such. But like, because queerness encompasses and um, contains so many different um, ideas and experiences and lives, uh, I thought it was Im I, I thought it was intellectually um, important and necessary that I try to honor that, um, and not just again not just out of the uh, politically convenient way, but because uh, even if I don't n know everyone in every community, it's it, it's important to me that like w there's a 
a sense of like this sounds silly but like cinematic solidarity like mm. even if i don't know like every uh, obviously i'm not going to know like every trans person or every intersex person or um whatever but like being able to engage with their stories and um or our stories is has been like an important part of my own identity formation to understand mm. their point of view and what um their desires uh their wants um and stories i, I think uh the the best that you can do is try to um, make sure that other people are as curious or as have the opportunity to explore those stories as well. Um, and even though it's, you know, within the constraints of the format, it was like kind of difficult just being able, just in terms of like, you know, wanting to include as much as possible so that it's like a fair and um, unique representation of queer cinema. I think uh, if I had not done that, uh, it would be like a significantly worse book. Yeah. Like, um, di- uh, it, 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 like a diversity and variation of what queerness looks like and means to other people is like, I think should be a testament to what queerness should look like in general. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I hesitated really to ask that question in a way, because reading through the book and looking through the different um, the different films that you'd selected, it struck me that there's such a rich, you know, and, and also given what you quite rightly said, not everybody has the equal access to the to the means of production or uh, or financing. Um, it's absolutely gobsmacking that there are so many great lesbian filmmakers and, and trans uh, films out there um, uh, that, to choose from. So there's not a sense that, you know, um, oh, I, I wish there was, yeah, Desert Hearts. I remember watching Desert Hearts back in the 90s and, and what, what a wonderful film that was. And Watermelon Woman, uh, which I only watched quite recently and, and again has that... Um, uh, push against that idea of trauma, even as it's looking at trauma. You know, it, 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 it's it's totally aware of history, but as you say, in a very playful way. It has fun. Like, uh, I, again, I mentioned that there's this misconception that a lot of queer films are like really depressing and only about death and whatnot. But uh, The Watermelon Woman is fundamentally about the absence of Black bodies, especially in queer movies, not just in Hollywood history in general, but like there is a problem with um, a a lack of um, representation of people of color within um, American queer cinema, particularly. Um, and Cheryl Dunier is able to interrogate those ideas with such levity and such uh, a sense of humor without having to sacrifice um, her own feelings of ambivalence about having to create fiction um, in place of, you know, quote unquote, real history. Mm, absolutely. And I mean, one thing I'd also uh, want to uh, make sure that we don't forget, I'd like to uh, get your comments on this as well, is uh, the book is beautifully illustrated by Andy Warren. And uh, it's mm-hmm. it's a real it's a real bonus to the to to the book that you get these uh, the, these illustrations. Um, I, I think it, it look it. It, it, yeah, as I say, it's a real bonus. Did you um, uh, were you sort of talking with um, uh, with your illustrator as part of that, or, or was he delivering those and you seeing them for the first time? He was delivering those, and I was seeing them for the first time as the book was wrapping up. And I just feel like it's incredibly thankful and grateful that uh, anyone is so talented, like mm-hmm. a really, really terrific designer and illustrator, and he I, I feel that this is like a really terrific marriage of of his um illustrations and, and designs and, and my words um and it, it really makes the book it's gorgeous to look at like um if this is going to be like something that we're encouraging people to like have in their home and have uh as like a an object i think it's so exciting and I feel in- incredible gratitude that he's able to make something so gorgeous with Smith Street books. And um, I feel very thankful to be a, a part of that. And it's really astonishing that he's able to sort of take these movies and distill them into like a, a it's, it's purest 
um, essence in a single image. And I think it's, it is to me not to, not to bash anyone else's book or anything, but like, it's fun to see like where, what an illustrator is going to do um, with a film, as opposed to just having a screenshot of the film in the book. Like this is his point of view about the film next to my point of view about a film. And they sort of come together to create this um, harmony, I guess. It's a real conversation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I mean, the other thing, again, you know, not, but I understand the, 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 ins and outs of making a book can be quite difficult but it's always the same three shots you get for every mm -hmm. film you know it's not like yeah. there are a lot there's a huge amount of you know film press, stills that you can use yeah, for it press you know. stills and stuff exactly yeah so um it's good to it's refreshing from that point of view as well uh so at the end of each of your sections you um uh, you recommend other films, so you do sort of manage in that way to sort of sneak sneak out of just having uh -huh. the hundred. Um, so, uh, which which if you were if you were allowed like a hundred and one films, which, which would be the one that you would that you would have uh, sort of the so uh, you are correct in that technically there are two hundred movies in the book. I did um, sort of cheat. And I have each entry have like a wine pairing, mm. um, if you will. Uh, if you like this movie, you might like this movie. Um, goes goes well with Gorgonzola. <laughs> exactly. Or fava beans and a nice Chianti. Um, <laughs> the, if I were to pick another movie um, that would be like 101, it would be a toss up between. I know that like he is overrepresented in the book, mm. um, but I can't help that he is one of my favorite filmmakers of all time. And I think his work is quite valuable. Um, it would be uh, Todd Haynes' is Safe from 1995 with Julianne Moore. When she plays a housewife who becomes allergic to her environment and such, so like having nosebleeds and whatnot. Um, I love that movie so much. Um, and that was that's included as a sidebar recommendation, but it was something that I did kind of want to write about more at length. Um, but, you know, space space, and, and, and um, list constraints and whatnot. Um, so it would be either that one or I would, it, I saw it after I filed the manuscript, but there's a film called Please Baby Please with Andrea Riseborough and mm. um, Henry Melig, um, who of Harry Potter fame, he was Dudley, I believe, and yeah. Cole Escola, the really wonderful um, comedian and actor. And it is like West Side Story meets Rebel Without a Cause meets Reiner Vander Fassbender meets John Waters meets Judith Butler. Um, where are they meeting? <laughs> on, on, the set, <laughs> on the set of Quirrell. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. The, it is It is very much that kind of like lurid color, um, very stripped down aesthetics. It, they're talking so explicitly about the nature of desire and gender. Um, and Andrew Riceborough, like, goes to the walls it's a really really an incredible performance um but that one's a lot of fun um and that that would also be like a, a fun pick for for number 101 yeah yeah i mean i think that's also something that's great in the book is as you go through it as you get towards the end there is a real sense that wow we're really opening up possibilities here there's so much more we can talk about and we can kind of sort of you know, th there's a lot more room for, for although I hesitate to say this after we've talked about Funeral Parade and Roses, <laughs> but, you know, there is more fun. There is there is an element uh, that we can get on. Absolutely. Right. Last question then, Kyle. Um, do you, Could you recommend a, another film book for our listeners? Yeah, yeah. Um, one of my favorite books is called... Um, this Young Monster by Charlie Fox, which is a collection of essays. Um, he's, I think, London-based or UK-based writer. Um, he's written for the New York Times, Dazed, Paper Magazine. He has a really, really beautiful point of view about the monstrous. And so this is a collection of essays about um, monstrosity and outsider identity. Um, and he has this like very long essay about Reiner Van der Fassbender, which was featured in the Paris Review. He has some um, essays about like his experience as um, a, a disabled queer person. Um, and 
how that informs his critical point of view. He has this really, um, this is not included in the book, but uh, the, a really beautiful essay that was included in the New York Times Magazine about Frankenstein as, as queer metaphor. And so he has such an, a rigorous and invigorating style and sense of language. Um, and he's he's just like one of the most exciting writers uh, I've ever read. And um, so This Young Monster by Charlie Fox is really, really great. Fantastic. Brilliant. Well, listen, Kyle, thanks so much for joining me and, and congratulations on the book. It's a, a really, as you said, lovely to look at because of the illustrations as well. But uh, it's a really great read and I recommend it to anybody interested in cinema. Thank you so much for having me, John. This has been so much fun. I really appreciate it. <laughs>